Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Slip Safety Show. I'm Christian Harris, the founder of Slip Safety Services. My guest today is Sunny Gopal from Red Risks. Sunny is a safety and risk professional with vast experience in the field. Uh, but the reason I wanted to get him on the show is because he, like me, is a fairly prolific content creator in the space and is really on a mission to help educate and drive awareness of the benefits and uh, the ways and whys of risk management. It's a great conversation. We talk about uh, his background, we talk about the types of content, we talk about his community that he's building up and some hints and tips on people uh, that are looking to drive content and to be uh, content creators in this space or indeed in any others. So uh, if that sounds of interest to you, I'm sure you'll get a lot out of this episode of the show. Let's crack on with it with Sunny Kapal. Sunny Gopal, welcome to the Slip Safety Show. Thanks, um, Christian. Good to see you on a uh, Saturday morning, um, bright and early. Thanks very much for giving up some of your weekend. Well, thank you. I, I just want to say it's very kind of you to have me on your show. It's a pleasure. In fact, it's the first time I said to you I've been on the on the other end of these things. So I'm a bit nervous, but let's see how it uh, goes. Well, there you go. Well, you, you grilled me, so now it's my time, my time to get some revenge. No, no, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> we'll, we'll, just have, we'll just have a chat. I mean, I think you've watched some of these before, so we'll just have a chat and uh, a few themes will come out and uh, we'll see yeah. where we go. So uh, do you want to start by giving uh, the audience a bit of background about you and sort of because you've done some really interesting uh, roles in the past and, and kind of where you've um, gone uh, in your journey to get to where you are today? Sure. Well, I feel quite old now going back into my history desk, but uh, I left um, Bradford University back in 87 with uh, a degree in chemical engineering. I actually then went off to New York to do a PhD but because of financial issues, I came back to the UK and, um, well, got back into chemical engineering. So originally my career started as a research chemical engineer. And I found that within a year into it, I was getting more and more into sort of safety related things. You know, back in those days, they were known as safety officers, almost yeah. like the safety police. Um, so it would be go to Sonny and talk to him about this and that and so on. So, my career then evolved into the situation where I got into consultancy, uh, started to do more for uh, sort of blue chip, uh, we'll call blue chip clients, major clients, et cetera, and started to also get more involved in oil and gas. So as, as a chemical engineer, it was quite natural for me to be involved with process safety and process engineering. So it was, a, I wouldn't say it was by design, it was more, more by default that I, I actually got into um, safety and risk management. And over the last sort of 30 years, I've sort of built up that profile and, and got very, very heavy into um, offering uh, clients advice mm -hmm. uh, from a risk perspective, from a safety management perspective. Yeah. Um, I, I could, of course, waffle on and on and on here and bore people to tears. So I, I'd sort of just say that I've thoroughly enjoyed my career. I think risk and safety management is something that is not everybody's cup of tea, but actually we, we do almost um, inherently every day in our lives. So for yeah. me, just a natural extension of what I was doing. From, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you done any um, any offshore sort of work, like been on, yeah. the, on rigs and things like that? One of my best uh, friends uh, did as uh, he works for Schlumberger. So he's right. done he's done stints. Uh, yeah, I, I ventured into it once, but it's not my cup of tea because uh, one of the things I, I'm, I'm a bit of a sociable creature, you know, and I, and I sort of like to spend time with people. And I found on rigs, it was getting very isolated. You know, mm. you, you're sort of cocooned for periods of time. Um, the sort of longest periods I've had are what they call four, four and four rotations. So yeah. I spent four weeks in the Sahara Desert in uh, in, Al in uh, Algeria, where I was. Uh, it was it was a real eye opener for me because the place was called Tegentor, and it's. Mm. You, I remember one occasion I st I stood in the desert and all I could see was just absolute nothingness yeah. you know it's one of the flattest uh, places on the planet and uh, it was fantastic done some crazy things out there we did a run in the sahara desert raising money so nice. i said i've been very fortunate I've, i think i've been to over 60 or 70 countries with hmm. the uh, career that i've chosen i've met some wow. 
really wonderful people. So yeah. no, not on oil rigs. It, it, you can't do much much uh, on those. But I, I do uh, admire the people who do those jobs because it can be very very isolated and yeah and, uh, lonely. <laughs> yeah, he, he's he's now sort of uh, worked his way up the ladder a bit, and he's in the more of a senior. Oh, right. uh, position but um yeah he started off um uh after uni went up to aberdeen and he was doing sort of yeah four on and four off or whatever whatever cycles yeah. it was he was he was on so uh, there's quite a few assets off uh, aberdeen of course you know there's yeah Neil ray bruce harding all the bp assets there's yeah there's lots of things going on there and i think uh solemn is another one that's somewhere off there but I think yeah he's 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 done um a stint in Nigeria and yeah. Norway, and he's now in the Congo. So, which is which is quite interesting. So, uh, Rough, yeah, getting yeah, to well, see. Uh, well, you know, there's always the uh, internet to keep him socially active now, and we're doing more and more of that nowadays, aren't we? I know. Yeah. Well, we yeah we could be in the Congo or wherever else, but as long as we had <laughs> as long as we had good enough internet, we'd be fine. Um, yeah. Could be could be anywhere at all in the world now. Which is Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Some, something interesting, and actually that that's one of the things I thought would be good to talk about was kind of. Um, technology from the perspective of you know getting the the message about safety and risk out there because you're very uh, prolific when it comes to content creation so what what kind of drove you down that that route and, and what inspired oh. you to, to to take that as a as a way wow. forward that's a deep question let me see if i can try and do it justice with a reasonable answer so i started podcasting way back i think it was in 2010 when i first started podcasting um and i and i enjoyed it i enjoyed it because um someone said to me you you should do a podcast and I, thought, I thought what the hell is a podcast you know so yeah. so i looked it up and i watched all these uh youtube uh, channels and learned how to do it and i set off and uh, it, it, the thing is you've got to be consistent and i wasn't very consistent because of course with job pressures and everything else you have to mm. you have to keep uh, the money coming in um so I started that and, and when I started it, I had one thing in mind and that is I wanted to share experiences and lessons learned in health and safety because as, as, I was, as I was getting into my career, I found it very difficult to get advice from people. Um, it was almost like a, a bit of a, a negative thought, you know, I can't ask them about this because they might think i'm not good at that yeah something, yeah you know so i thought well we really we really need to encourage people to go into risk and safety management environmental management so i started the podcast and hmm. um, it took off but with it not being consistent it was a bit hit and miss yeah and then i totally went off the radar um for about four years when i was working with a super major an oil, oil and gas super major and then in 2016, after 25, nearly 30 years in the industry, I thought it's about time I took a bit of a chill pill, you know, I mean, not having seen my daughter grow up and uh, my wife is uh, always terrified when I go off to some of these uh, not exotic locations. You know? Far flung. Far flung, yeah. Iraq, Iran, you name it, um, mm. Azerbaijan, uh, Kazakhstan. So I then got into more digital stuff uh, with uh, videos, vlogs, blogs, and so on. Now, up until then, I had someone doing things for me, and it cost a fortune. And mm. I didn't realize that actually I had, I had nothing to show for it. Mm. So I started to learn how to do digital stuff because. Well, being a control freak, you know, I wanted to reduce my risk as well. Yeah. So I then learned how to do it. And in 2019, I was ready. I was ready to hit that green button. I started, uh, as you know, um, redrisks.com. Yeah. Um, I've been very, very lucky. Yeah, I've had some fantastic guests and hosts, and uh, including your good self to, to sort of add content and value. And only after taking control of things that I now found I'm getting to a point where my mission is what the vision was, which is to share uh, educational content, to get people to engage, because I've never considered myself to be an influencer. In fact, I, I don't even like the word uh, influencer. It's like, it reminds me of that illness, the influencer. You know? <laughs> I, I prefer more of a facilitator. I've always been a facilitator and a networker. So now with live streaming, I, I just love it. I just love the fact that I could be talking to people in different parts of the world on LinkedIn Live or YouTube or Facebook. And, and they, they are, and, it, and the circumstances are right. They're with lockdown uh, or whatever, they are able to network and communicate. 
So again, not by design, purely by default, it's got to me a point, got me to a point where I'm, I'm actually doing what I want to do and I love doing. Mm. I made that very long, Christian. I hope you don't mind. But I think- no, no, that's good. I think that gives a really good insight. And I think one of the one of the things that really struck a chord with me there was actually that that point about influencer because I, I I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I, you know, I, I, I'm trying to be a bit more prolific. I mean, I'm pretty prolific on my LinkedIn posts, but in terms yes, of other types are. of content, yeah. um, and actually, uh, the last thing I would want is people to think. I'm trying to grab the attention because that's not what I'm doing at all. Actually, what I want to do is try and, and you're the same, I think, is try and shine the light on the topic yeah. that needs the attention. So it's not about it's not about you or I. It's about actually this important topic and trying to raise awareness of, of that. So, yeah. yeah, I'm definitely on board with you there. I mean, one of the things to mention there is, I mean, I have my own people that I watch and they're not health and safety people. I watch news readers, for example, are fantastic uh, to watch in terms of how they deliver things. And I noticed when I first started doing videos, um, there's a little bit of, um, well, I know just as much as you, and I want to talk about it just as much as you. So there's a bit of a competition going on with the guest. And then it takes, it takes someone to point that out to you. And my wife is very good. She pointed out to me, listen, you know your stuff, but also there are other people who might know more than you. And I thought, yeah, that is, that is. So it took me a while to realize that we need to get people on the show, uh, on these discussions who really have a lot to say. So I, I started to go away from what I call the A-list people. Um, I, I still value what they think. I still think they have a great thing to say, but there are so many other people out there who don't have that podium or don't have the opportunity to do those things. Mm. And that's why I then changed how I approach these things. And that's why live events are great with live chats. You can have Joe blogs at the other part of the world who will say yeah. something. Think, God, I never knew that. Even mm. after 30 years of experience, I never knew that. So mm. I think it's, I think it's a fantastic opportunity and uh, situation we're in right now with the uh, digital media. Yeah. And, and the other thing is that it, li it lives on, doesn't it? So you can do a live, but then that gets recorded and, um, you know, it's a scalable asset or a scalable resource for, for people to use, you know, whenever and wherever they are, because it's not like a, a book. You can only turn the pages, a, a one copy of a book, you can turn the pages a thousand times and it's probably a bit tatty, whereas a, a YouTube video, you can watch it again and again and again. Yeah, um, yeah you, you're bang on about the... Um, some of these hosts, I think um, I can think of someone in particular. I won't mention any names. Who, uh, <laughs> who, who, I can think, who of, I can think of quite a few, but I won't mention them. Who, uh, who, 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 who seems to like the sound of his own voice quite a lot. But, uh, but I hope uh, that's not. I hope that's not me. <laughs> no, it's not you. It's not you. <laughs> um, so you've talked about doing doing the lives, and, and you mentioned you touched on red risk. Do you want to just give us a kind of a, a map yeah. out of, of what you've got and what you're doing and yeah, sure. I mean, so red risk is all about reduced risks. And um, while I'm a big fan of the word safety, I, I try and go away from the word safety using the word safety. I think of it as risks and risk management. So that's why I called it reduced risks. Um, and the focus is really all about taking people to a point where they don't just see safety as safety, you know, I mean, that nanny culture safety as well. I want them to understand what risk is and the risk equation. It's all about consequences and likelihood and understanding how to manipulate those, those things or make, make better decisions on those um, inputs. Mm. So red risks is focusing not just on process safety or occupational safety or workplace safety. We also look at things that like, could be anything from health and well-being why not even financial risks? You know, I, I do want to make risks more of an understandable subject rather than just focusing on, uh, you know, uh, everyday events or, you know, driving or whatever. We need to, we need to get the mindset to the point where we understand risk a lot better. Yeah. And I think that that will go a long way in terms of culture changes in a working environment as well. Does that sound, does, I mean, you're in the same line of work, so it probably, what do you yeah, think? I suppose I my view would be um, I know I've got safety in the in the name of my company, but that's partly because we like the we like the alliteration. But I kind of feel like risk management is a grown up conversation, right? Interesting. If that, if that makes sense, um, yeah, it does. With a bit more gravitas and a bit more kind of, um, I mean, look, you can't get away from the fact that you know in safety and risk management, you know, we're, we're, our primary function is to stop people getting hurt. Yeah. 
but actually when it comes to getting things done um companies might say safety is our number one priority but in reality they're always conscious of of pounds and shillings and therefore i think risk management brings in some of this insurance and return on investment and all this other stuff which i think is an important uh, aspect to consider if you want to actually enact change if, if that makes sense yeah it does i mean my my, my mindset change i mean i mean my origins were as a process engineer right mm. so we're looking into um sort of uh low low sort of uh, potentials low probability but significant consequences yeah. catastrophic consequences yeah. So you've got you've got the two extremes. You've got the workplace safety or occupational safety and health, which looks at um, high probability, uh, but you know less of consequences. Not always, right? Yeah. And then you've got the other end, which is process safety. So I, I sort of stretch across all of that continuum. And for me, I've always well, I've always harped on about something called the safety continuum. You could call it the risk continuum. But there are really four cycles for me that you can go through. There's design, mm -hmm. there's engineering, procedures, and people, right? Yeah. So all of those elements in a company or in whatever you do has safety aspects. Yeah. Now, in the UK, Europe, and States, you'd find that there's been a greater focus or there's more focus now on the other end in terms of people, right? Mm -hmm. People risks, people safety, people exposure. But if you go to somewhere like, um, let's say, India or mm -hmm. Africa, you're still at the front and middle-ish end in terms of design and engineering and procedures. Mm -hmm. So it's a fascinating, I think it's a fascinating continuum to be in. And you have to pick the area that you're in very wisely because you could be addressing risk and safety management in an area which is you know, it's really not that are going to make that much of a change or that much of a difference. It's mm. almost like revising for an exam. You know, if you've got 10, 10 subjects at school uh, and you're revising for it, you always, I always tended to gravitate towards something that I enjoy yeah. and I would read more and more about it. I probably get the worst mark in the subject, but it's just something that I enjoy doing. Mm. Whereas the harder subjects, you'd sort of tend to leave a bit, but. That's human nature, I think, isn't it? People, people. Absolutely. Uh, and there you've hit the nail, you know, bang on head. It is human nature. It's about human behaviors. It's about, and I'm getting so involved in this, in, in the live events, talking to people about neural networks and neuroplasticity. And I'm thinking, yeah, I can understand this conversation. Hmm. Ask me four years ago, I said, bleh, right? Yeah, yeah. But now that, I understand it. Yes, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, as you know, not a safety professional, you know, that's not my background or training and nor am I a insurance professional. But, you know, the more you spend time in these worlds, you, you start to talk in, in all the uh, all the right circles and you, you get to understand a lot of the concepts and the processes and things. And, you know, and then that's, that's a, a valuable place to be. But it's changed as well. I mean, I've had to change as well. Um, I changed because of doing the shows. I realised that. Uh, as, a, as a process person, you tend to think in blocks, you know, you don't think about um, psychology or human behavior or dynamics, but having done these shows, it, it's been a, it's been an eye opener for me that really we do need to get down into the gray cells and understand what it is that makes people do things in a certain way. And there are some fantastic uh, books out there, Doohig's Habit uh, book and various others, but there is a big part in it, but like I said, you have to decide on which part of the continuum you're in mm. before you start drilling and spending vast amounts of resources. And now a word from our sponsors. Hi guys, sorry to interrupt the flow of the show, but I wanted to give a very quick plug for our sponsor, which actually is me and my business, Slip Safety Services. As you'll have gathered from tuning in, we're passionate about three things, slip safety, cleanliness and hygiene. If any of those topics float your boat and you'd like to learn more about what we do, the outcomes we help to generate for our clients and how it all really works, then please visit our website slipsafety.co.uk slash start. There you'll find a raft of information from articles to videos to white papers to self-help tools and you can start to delve deep into the rabbit hole of the world that we populate uh, which is all about making the world a cleaner, safer, more hygienic place. Cheers.
Yeah, yeah. And I think that continuum is an interesting thing to, to consider because I can think of a particular um, client, or well, they're not even a client really, a prospect, I suppose you call them, a company I've been talking with. And they would they would say when it comes to what I do, we're, we need to focus on this, on the people stuff and we've got to get all this right and so on. But actually I look at them and I and I see that they haven't got the building blocks earlier on in that continuum right and therefore they're almost not wasting their time because they will get some benefit from that end of it but actually they'd probably get more benefit from going rewinding a bit and going back to some more kind of basic stuff yeah well the line of work that you're in is is it's quite interesting because when people think of slips trips and falls on the ah people right but it's not because you have uh you you touch every bit of that continuum right mm. if it's not designed correctly you can have slip trips and falls right if the engineering isn't done properly, the procedures aren't there, and of course we've got the people end as well. Yeah. So you've got a you've got a pretty tough task in the sense that you've got to cover across the entire uh, spectrum of that yeah. continuum. So um, I, I I don't I don't envy your. <laughs> 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 well, it's it's we're making progress, which is good. You know, it's it's uh, I I can certainly see that. Um, <sighs> maybe the accident statistics aren't quite reflecting it yet across the whole country, but, you know, in terms of the awareness and things, architects and so on, you know, we're, we're at a much better place now than we were 10 years ago. So I feel as if we're, we're moving in the right direction, which is, which is all you can do, I suppose. Is there a point when you'd say, well, I think we've, we've uh, bottomed out or is it just an evergreen process? No, I mean, <clears throat> I think, look, if you consider that there's 300,000 people here going to A&E and there's, over a billion pounds of insurance claims. Um, there's a long way to go for us mm -hmm. to feel, you know, we're never going to eradicate the insurance claims. We're never going to eradicate the hospital visits. But, you know, could that number be 150,000 instead of 300,000? Well, yeah. So in which case, there's a long way to go still. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you say is your biggest challenge then? I mean, in that, in that continuum of design, engineering procedures and people, would you say that would you say that we would go back and we'd address the design issues so that we'd never have all the other issues? I would say that um, it's hard to, I think if you've got a new building, then, you know, we would always try and start with getting the design right, of course. But obviously, if you're somebody like a big supermarket chain or, or a leisure club chain or a hotel chain, and you've got hundreds or thousands of sites, you know, that, that ship has sailed almost. Um, so I think it's really trying to understand what are the bespoke things that need to be done for each individual customer. And they're always going to be slightly different. Mm. Um, I think the biggest challenge for me is, is that people, a bit like that example I gave, people kind of still look at this issue quite superficially and they don't want to get delved down into that detail. Whereas I think if they did, that's when they would see the, the better outcomes. Mm, yeah, I mean, I, I've come across clients in the past who, um, I, I mean, I don't, I don't, I might get toasted for this, but I think clients are generally in the five to ten million pound turnover a year who, who have uh, the biggest uh, sort of challenges uh, in respect to slips, trips, and falls. And I, I'm not just putting in that category; it's the only one I can think of straight yeah. away. But you can think of lots of other things like manual, manual handling, handling or ergonomics or whatever. Yeah. But there's a, there's a bigger there's a bigger uh, distribution of of companies in that sort of um, uh, turnover when it comes to those sort of risks. Is that is that your experience as well? Yeah, I think if you look at it proportionally, I mean, clearly, if you're a supermarket with two thousand stores, you're going to have a lot of accidents. But if you look at it as a proportion of the people going through your building, it's mm. probably very low. Um, so, you know, you need to, that's where getting the, the right data and the right analysis is really important. Um, and one of the, one of the challenges for the insurance companies, because um, if you look at it from a uh, insurance risk management perspective, they're just looking at the claim numbers. They're not necessarily thinking about, well, what, what's that number in the context of what that business is doing? Um, so, yes, I would say, I think if you think about, you know, that discussion between safety and risk management at a five to 10 million turnover, you're probably in the safety world. You're not necessarily in that risk management world because you're not as as kind of large an organization and you're probably not investing as much in in thinking about things mm -hmm. which are kind of quite um, advanced, let's say, as risk management. 
and so then you know you're you're not making these strategic decisions and then you're going to have issues it's an interesting point you made earlier about um you would say risk is more like the 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 sort of past the primary school into college level yeah. and so on. You, know, you say it's like a grown-up conversation and actually it's not too far from what i've experienced as well i mean when when um, I've done a lot of work in Africa over the last three or four years, and I work for investment uh, bankers, um, and they, they they sort of wheel me in as a risk expert. And the, the, generally, the people who are in the in the sort of commercial and financial side, they they sort of harp to it as risk management. Okay, they don't see that word safety. It's always mm -hmm. about risk risk management. I suppose where I'm going with this conversation is to say that yeah, I mean you could consider that, but it's fundamentally only just two pieces put together. I mean, you can add other bells and whistles to it, but it's just consequences. It's the product of consequences and likelihood. Yeah. If we can get people to just understand that, we go a long way. I mean, yeah. consequences, everybody understands consequences, right? They do. Yeah. Just... yeah, they do. Although I think, uh, again, a challenge in the kind of uh, attritional high volume, low, uh, a low um, severity end is that at a again using that example of a five to ten million pound turnover business you know you might have one or two claims a year um and so, and so you think well i've got my insurance to cover me and i perhaps don't need to do much about it whereas yeah. it's not until you bundle all of these companies up and you get to the insurer level where you suddenly you're sitting there as axa and you're spending 80 million a year on claims where actually that's a hell of a lot of money <laughs> um so I think that consequences piece, um, you know, perhaps people don't always see the real depth of the consequences um, at a sort of local site level. Yeah, That's, I mean, we, 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 one of the problems that we've got and we, and we do face this is that in the world of risk, safety, whatever, we're, we're in this constant laboratory of invent, invention, right? Mm. We keep inventing new things. We keep inventing new phrases. Like uh, I saw something the other day. I thought, well, why do we have to keep reinventing these things? Surely the more you have, I mean, one of my favorite books is by Edward de Bono. It's called Simplicity. Mm. I'm hoping to connect with him so I can get him on the show one day. He's in his 80s now. Mm. But he's been an idol to me because that book has resonated in nearly everything that I do. We don't have to make things complex. We no. have to keep things simple. Safety is safety. Safety does what safety does, right? Risk is that. So I get I get really peeved and I get, oh, I get I get on my soapbox here, and you might get me going on this, but I get on my soapbox when I hear people talk about how we need a new thing, a new fandango, or whatever. No, we don't. We just need to talk a little bit more openly and make it more uh, educationally. Uh, available to individuals as well, so that they they understand it better. Sorry, I got on my phone. Yeah. No, no, I think I think you're right, and I think I think um, one of the other things I would say is if you think about getting the basics right, um, you know, if you're a health and safety risk professional and you you've been working in a business for five years, you kind of feel as if you've crafted it and shaped it, and you're doing all these things right, uh, and then the next part you leave and because you you want a new challenge and someone else comes in and actually they they can spot areas where perhaps you could have been doing things better and I think it's very difficult to uh it's very difficult to get people to almost go a bit backwards and, and look at the basics um because people kind of feel they're beyond that it'd be a bit like you know uh somebody who's got a PhD and, and saying well actually you're you know your maths uh, there's one area of your maths here which is a bit more a level be like, oh you know that would be quite or calling saying somebody they're telling somebody they've got a an ugly child you know you don't want to be doing that so i think there's a there's a there's a challenge there about communication and uh and education um about yeah. getting those basic things well I, I think you've hit the nail on the head it's about communication mm -hmm. you know i mean we we talk about communication safety as being very important well let's communicate it without adding more mud into the equation you know with different phrases different expressions how many acronyms do we know in health and safety for example right yeah. and some of the acronyms are are the same but different meanings right? yeah. so I, I think yeah you're right that when you take over a job from whoever it's only natural to say well they didn't do this didn't do that that's a performance thing and yeah maybe that person was fired because they didn't perform right or they they went on 
But I think for me, it's all about communication and forget whoever's doing the job, but think about the people at the shop floor level. Think mm. about the person in the control room who has to react to an alarm when things are going pop outside, right? Those sort of individuals, if you make communication too complex, yeah. they don't have much of a chance. Mm. Yeah. The simplicity for me is really important. That, that doesn't mean to, there's the other expression that Edward de Bono uses called oversimplification, right? Oversimplification is when we lost the value of what simplification is all about. So we tend to think, well, let's make it even more simpler. And we've oversimplified it to the point where it becomes meaningless. Mm. There's a very fine line between being complex, uh, simplification, oversimplification. Yeah, yeah, I've got a future guest. If I can tempt him to come on, he is what I, someone's described. He's quite intimidating. Someone's described him as being uh, someone who has a brain the size of a planet. Okay, I won't give the name away, but um, he has this structure where he talks about um, simple, uh, co uh, complex. Uh, sorry, simple, complicated, complex, and chaotic. Right now. Interviewing him is going to be really interesting for me because some of the principles there go against the grain of what risk and safety management people think about. So mm, looking mm. forward to that one with, with fingers biting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just, I just found somebody the other day. Um, his name's Simon Bowen and he's all about um, visual models. Uh, yeah. And um, I've only watched a few of his things so far, <clears throat> but it looks fascinating because it's all about just trying to distill complex things into very simple yeah. visual models like yes. you know processes or, or triangles or you know a bit like the hierarchy of risks yes kind of thing yes um and i think the more we can do of that you know the, the better because yeah. um i mean you've written a book and and i think the average reading age of an adult in uh, in the uk and america is is 12 or something like that so you have yeah. you know you can't be hoi folloi and sort of overly complicated you've got to be precise and simple and straightforward otherwise people just won't get it no that that book writing thing is an interesting one actually uh, my wife will watch this video and she'll say oh right, i understand that bit so um back in 1999 i i i wanted to write a book and mm. i approached a few publishers and they said you're not a known entity go away little boy and all those things oh well bugger you lot, I'll write it myself. So I yeah. wrote the, I wrote, uh, the, I think the first ebook in uh, environment health and safety and I published it. And um, this was while I was in the Middle East. So it was quite nice because it funded a few things. Mm. Like everything, I, I tend to take things because when someone says, well, no, you, you can't do it. And I take those challenges. I don't see why people should be held back because mm. someone says you can't do it. So I did that. And then I, I sold the copyright, which I hadn't um, came to the UK. And then when I started doing these shows and things, and I thought, you know what? Most people I have interviewed say they've got 15 books or 20 books. It became a bit of an ego thing. You know, I thought, mm. I want to write a book, but I'm not going to go to a publisher because the people who I've interviewed who've written these books have said, I mean, Scott Geller, for example, a couple of others have said, I lost control of the book mm. as soon as someone took it over for that. So I thought, well, I've got all these digital skills. I might as well make use of them. So I actually went through and did a pod, which is published on demand and all yeah. the other things. And because of that Edward de Bono connection, I wanted to write a book on risk management, which is basically like a dummy's guide. Mm -hmm. So I actually sort of complemented what Edward de Bono did by calling the book Risk Management Simplified. Mm -hmm. So to me, all the roads have to lead in a certain way to Rome. And I, and I try and pull on all those experiences and try and make it happen. Mm. What I think at the end of the day, if you want to write a book, if you want to do something and you feel you're not going to do it because someone's holding you back or someone says you can't do it, don't listen to them. Mm. Do it. We're in a technology rich environment now and you should never ever be held back to share your thoughts and experiences and yeah. i think you've written a book haven't you you got one in in the works i haven't written one but i've i've kind of got the plannings of one um so it's something that probably 2021 i think i'm gonna i'm gonna try and uh, get it out there I've, I've i've got a lot of the content already done to be honest um i think uh, thinking about a title um i haven't quite got there yet but um 
That's the hardest bit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've got a couple of ideas, but I won't. I won't. I'll, I'll perhaps share them with you offline. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I think um, I've got a bit of a plan and structure, and you know, I'm not suggesting it's going to be the world's best seller, but uh, oh, I, I don't have... don't ever do that. I yeah. never went into it thinking. I'm going to sell a million. No, I did it purely as a vanity project right up front. And then it became a bit more of a, um, I want to do it project. I really feel uh, empowered to do this project. Uh, Dominic Cooper's read the book and he said, you can read the book in an afternoon, but it's the simplest book I've ever read and the most valuable book I've ever read in risk safety and you know, oh, risk yeah. management. There you go. So I, I actually did what I want to do and you know, set out to do. So if yeah. you want to do it, you can do it. Hmm. Yeah, there's no such thing as you can't do it, right? No. It might take a little bit longer, but you will do it. Yeah, yeah. I think there are these kind of hybrid publishing places now as well, where you can kind of get it done sort of semi-professionally and yes, but still retain the control. And yeah, yeah. I, I don't imagine Harper Collins going to give me a million pound advance regrettably. <laughs> hey, by the time you're on your tenth book, yeah, yeah, they might even make a Hollywood blockbuster out of it. Who knows? Yeah, uh, what could we call it? Oh, we'd have to think, we have to think of something clever for that. Da, da, da. <laughs> oh, you remember that Pearl and Dean advert? Whenever you go to the picture, da, 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 you could be <laughs> Christian Harris. <laughs> you see, uh, I've got you thinking now. I've got you, you see, I've taken your mind to thinking about the place. title for the book. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, all, I, I've, I, yeah, I, I've got, I've, I've got a good title, I think. But as I say, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I want to, I need to check. Oh, I nearly got it out of you. <laughs> I need to check the domain name as well. Um, there's no point in choosing a, a book title without a domain name. No, um, I, if you tell me, I'll buy it and I'll sell it to you for ten times the amount. <laughs> ah, there you go. Perfect. 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 Oh, terrible. Yeah. No, I think um, just, just, just do it. The old um, sports company. Uh, yeah. low, um, strap line i think is perfect just do yeah, it yeah and um i think it, i think you doing these shows you know i know it takes time to do these things right mm. i know it takes a lot of effort i think it takes it takes courage it takes mm. conviction to be on camera and do what you do so i applaud you and i admire you for Thank doing you, this yeah. because there aren't many people who do it so hats off to you no, well, and the same, and the same to you. I mean, yeah, you're right. It's because uh, you're putting, even if you're just interviewing somebody, you're still putting yourself out there. Because actually, mm -hmm. you can look, as you kind of alluded to about the guy with the big brain. You know, you can you can potentially look stupid um, interviewing somebody if they sort of trip you up or something. Not that anybody wants to do that, but um, yeah. it's, it's okay to be tripped up so long as they're yeah. not arrogant about it. Yeah, um, yeah. But again, I think it's, you know, we, we've got the same kind of vision or mission, whichever way you look at it, which is about shining the light on this issue and trying to help people to make better decisions and move in a better, in a better uh, path. So, you know, yeah. I think if you, if you're doing it for the right reason, then why wouldn't you do it? And, um, yeah. you know, I'd, I'd encourage people, you know, there's lots of, lots of good podcasts and good content creators have sprung up in the last few years, you know, like, mm -hmm. um, the Jay. last few months yeah in even the last few months yes yeah, it's, it's going kind of exponentially so well i suppose in the last few months you know we're recording this in october 2020 and obviously people have had a bit more time on their hands to you know to uh to, to start doing this i mean actually lockdown was the spur for me to start doing the videos you know because i had i think if you look at our youtube channel i probably had i think i'd done a couple of interviews um and a few other videos but actually since uh since March, you know, my output has been massively bigger. Um, and, and, and it's, you know, partly because it, it, it was a bit of a spur to say, well, actually, I've got a bit more time at home now, obviously, where I can sit down and schedule stuff and I'm not buzzing around all over the country. So let's put it to good use and and uh, and create some content. So, yeah, no, it's Absolutely, been Absolutely, yeah. Good. yeah. I mean, I good. think everybody should have a crack at it because it not only builds confidence, but it allows you to network. It allows you to engage within your own community and your own professional sort of um, band. Yeah. Um, one thing I would do is would say to everybody and anybody who sets off in this is don't get bogged down by numbers, right? No. Don't get into the mindset that I haven't got enough subscribers. I haven't done. It's nothing to do with that. What you do today will only, well, 
pay dividends three years from now, right? Or two years from now. Exactly. Don't, don't get bogged down in, I haven't got so many YouTube subscribers or I haven't got this, I haven't got that. No. I mean, I, I look at it as, um, you know, I can't, I can't remember the last time I checked, but um, I, I, I think I normally get something like 10 hours a week of people mm. watching my YouTube stuff. Well, actually, if you think of it, you know, that's the equivalent of me having... 10 meetings with people yes, you know, yes. that, I, that I'm not having because actually they're taking in the content and learning stuff and hopefully it's helping them and I'm not having to be there. So, you know, that's great, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, that, I, if, if I'm allowed to plug one thing about the shows that we do, the live stream shows, and I said we there because it's not just me, hmm. we have the stream team, is for me, it's all about diversity and inclusion. And we focus on three pillars for Red Risks, connect, share, learn. If we stick to those three pillars, then the other bits that hang off it are diversity and inclusion. Mm. I want everybody in the world to feel like they're a part of it. I know it's a utopian type of thing, but I do want them to do that. And I invite everybody in the world to come on it, to say their chat comments. And in future shows, I'm going to actually, because I can host 10 people on that stream uh, function, I'm going to have two or three slots that are spare. On air, I'm going to give them that link and say okay, the first yeah. three that get mm. it. Nice. Come online, right? That's a good idea. Because I don't, I don't want people to feel that oh, it's a special watering hole, it's an elite club, or it's not. No. It's nothing to do with that. No. If you've got an important story to tell and it can help someone, share it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That's that's great. Um, well, give give us give us some plugs then. So where can where can people get involved and uh, find more information about what you're up to? That's, that's kind of, yeah. Well, I mean, the, the website, redrisks.com. Um, I try and update it on a daily basis. Now it's more like a weekly basis as the shows are start to grow. Mm. But I've tried to streamline my workflow in such a way that it, it doesn't take over your life. That's another thing you've got to be careful of. It doesn't take over your life. So I just live stream straight to my LinkedIn profile, Sonny Gopal. Um, and then I also live stream to the YouTube channel, and also to Facebook. I'm not a big fan of Twitter. I think Twitter is all about microblogging, and I think, I think it has more propensity to get some nasty feedback. Yeah. You know? Not that I, I I don't like nasty feedback. I think it, it's a different type of uh, um, sort of mindset there. A bit so more key, me, keyboard warriors. Yeah, yeah, and and I think it, mine's not microblogging. It's about community engagement, networking, and so on. Yeah, one day I'll go to Twitter, but it's not it's not my cup of tea at the moment. Um, yeah. But LinkedIn Live is on my profile on LinkedIn and uh, Facebook and YouTube channel is just Red Risks. Um, yeah. I would welcome any of your uh, followers, your subscribers to join. We I would like to think that we joined at the hip on this. We have yep. the same mission, the same mm -hmm. vision. So what's mine is yours, and what's yours is mine, right? So yep. let's, let's let's do that and um, try and encourage this. Great. And there's the LinkedIn group as well, isn't there? There is a LinkedIn group. It's just RASP, which is Risk and Safety Professionals Group. I think you're in there. Yeah. Um, surprisingly, I never thought I'd get even 10 people, but I think we're heading towards 1,000 now. So, mm. again, it's not about numbers. It's purely about letting people know that we try and operate that group without adverts. Yeah. You know? Nowadays, you can't get on LinkedIn without someone sending you something on something else or whatever. And I want to... I want to try and get people really engaged at a technical level and also at, a, at an educational level as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, thanks for mentioning that. That's pretty good. Um, and yeah. also, uh, not far away, um, email-wise, just send, you can send it to the live email address, which is live at redrisks.com, and um, do, do join us. I, I hope we can have you on our, on our live event one day. Yeah, right? we'll book it in. Don't worry, we'll book it in. In fact, we'll, 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 once we finish this interview, we'll get something in the diary and we'll get good. on there. Good, good. Perfect. I'm, I'm grateful for you to ask me. I think you're the first, first person to have asked me to be at the other end of the camera. It's <laughs> I didn't realise how, how nerve-wracking it can be, actually. <laughs> Let's be kinder to my guests. <laughs> oh, no, no, you're, you're very kind. Don't worry about that. Um, yeah, I, well, I, I, st I've, I did a few uh, interviews before ever interviewing somebody. I look at it as um, it, it, it's not dissimilar to doing like a sales conversation really in that it's just about asking questions and then giving a couple of interjections of insight and try and let the other person talk as you say so you know my objective is that I'm not doing any more than 20% of the talking 
Well, you've certainly succeeded. I think I've talked so much. So apologies. <laughs> well, that's the idea. You know, you're, you've gone for the Pareto principle there, and the 80 20. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's amazing how many things in life do fit that, uh, do for that oh, mold. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Your name's on the on the on the headline, so you're the attention grabber here. So we need to be hearing from you. <laughs> that's the idea. <laughs> great uh, well yeah, thanks I'm... again thanks again for your time i really appreciate it and Pleasure. um yeah we'll look forward to engaging some more and and uh, uh in the various channels and and uh yeah we'll get on get on and do a live pleasure and uh thank you for keeping the fire alive and keeping this going and i'm very very honored to be a guest on your show thanks christian Pleasure. cheers take care